Hello, we are Molly and Stephanie and we welcome you to this new and awesome weekly Space News Wednesday. Your number one show to get all the space news you'll ever need. Want to know what's going on in the International Space Station, in the universe, and what new discoveries are being made all around our solar system? Stay tuned and simply enjoy this pilot of the weekly news update for everybody. On Thursday, July 16, spacewalker Chris Cassidy, commander of Expedition 63, got some support from Bob Behnken on the 230 spacewalk at the International Space Station. They removed the last six of the 48 aging nickel-hydrogen batteries and installed the last three missing new lithium-ion batteries, totaling to 24 new batteries, and to complete the power circuit, installed an adapter plate on each of them. The mission to swap the batteries begun last year, continued into January, and was a very complex and time-consuming upgrade progress. On July 1st, the astronauts already routed power and Ethernet cables in preparation for the installation of a new wireless communication system just for us. So we were already able to view the latest spacewalk with enhanced HD camera. Bob Behnken had the opportunity to get into the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, BEAM, to perform some activities inside. BEAM has been attached to the ISS Tranquility module since April 2016. Speaking of Bob, he'll be returning to Earth with Doug on August 2nd aboard the Dragon Ship Endeavour, as Elon called it. Felix will be live streaming the splashdown with TJ and Marcus. And while we're talking about Crew Dragon, let's talk about the capsule. With the first crewed flight of a SpaceX Crew Dragon on my 30s this year, the foundation for the first reusable space vehicle produced by SpaceX was laid. With the launch, the commercial crew program hit the first major milestone and successfully delivered Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley to the ISS. Now, NASA and SpaceX have modified their contract agreement to give SpaceX the permission to reuse previously flown Crew Dragons on top of a Falcon 9 booster to send further astronauts to the ISS. Originally, SpaceX had to use a new Crew Dragon plus a brand new Falcon 9 booster to launch astronauts from US soil. Now, the modified commercial crew transportation capability contract will enable SpaceX to reuse a Crew Dragon sometime in 2021, starting with Crew 2 for the first time. In fact, from now on, all commercial crew program contractors will be allowed to reuse their spacecrafts on crewed flights. As NASA spokesperson Stephanie Shearholz reportedly told Space News, NASA performed an in-depth review and determined that the terms of the overall contract modifications were in the best interests of the government. Time to talk about the fascinating bright star Betelgeuse with its home in the constellation of Orion. After getting our attention with its unique blinking, a team from the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg has uncovered the reason behind its recent dimming. It is caused by large star spots on Betelgeuse's surface. Sorry, dust is ruled out now. While undergoing frequent brightness variations go hand in hand with being a giant red star, the luminosity's drop of about 40% in only seven months was quite the surprise. After trying to explain the change with various scenarios and a possible imminent supernova, the international team led by Tavisha Demavardena finally demonstrated that temperature variations in the photosphere or outer shell of the star was caused by star spots. All right now, but what are star spots? Have you ever heard about sunspots? These darker appearing dots in the sun's luminous photosphere? They are caused by a lower surface temperature than the area surrounding it and can mostly be seen in pairs or small groups. Star spots are basically the same, just up to 100% bigger than the tiny spots on our sun. Now let's imagine that this is Betelgeuse and the gigantic cool star spots are covering over 50 to 70% of its surface. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's kind of weird now. Let's uh, head on to the next topic, I'd say. <laughs> it was a good idea. 
Already in 2019, Pioneer Astronautics with its president, Dr. Robert Zubrin, was selected by NASA to develop a new battery and a gas spectrometer specially for use on the moon. The lunar flow battle should be a scalable, long-duration device with minimum capacity loss over many cycles to store energy for astronauts and for the first moon habitants. Its other big advantage is that its electrolytes are derived from the lunar regolith, reducing the needed mass transported to the moon. Recently, they received further funding under the SBIR Phase 2 together with three other companies. Locally produced oxygen is vital for lunar habitats and steel is a well-proven building material. Both of these are heavy and transporting them from Earth is immensely expensive. This shows us that in-situ resource utilization or ISRU will be a key component in the crewed lunar Artemis program as well as the later human exploration of Mars. Looks like NASA's Inside Rovers module might be stuck. Again. The self-hammering mold that'll give us insight into Mars interior has been having problems since early 2019. Recently, the scientists seem to have resolved the problem, using Rover's robotic arm to push the mold to the Martian soil. But NASA has found possible evidence that the mold might have started bouncing in place again. Comet Neowise. Anyway, Comet Neowise passed closest to the sun on July 3rd, 2020. It is expected to remain visible to the naked eye throughout July. It has brightened to magnitude plus one while developing a second tail. Get your binoculars out and look at it at its closest approach to Earth tomorrow, July 23rd, because you might be able to tell the difference between the tails. The slightly curved tail of dust and the other perfectly straight blue gas tail. But what about it? Why do comets develop tails? It is pretty common for a comet to have two tails. They start to appear when the comet approaches the sun. When they're far away from the sun, the body remains completely frozen, as the sun's radiation is far too weak to cause any notable effects. Only as the comet gets closer to the sun will its energy start to push small dust particles away, and these particles start to form a long gray or white tail. So whatever color the material of the main body from the comet is, the main or dust tail will always have the same color and appears to curve due to the change of relative forces and its motion. In other words, every grain of dust has a different size and gets a different flight path because of that. Secondary tail, on the other hand, never does have the same color as the comet. It will instead be blue, faint, and will always make a perfect line pointing away from the sun. Because unlike dust, every ion particle is identical and follows the same motion while forming a plasma that creates a magnetosphere around the comet. On July 9th, Dr. Namekata and colleagues observed 12 stellar flares, including a rare, extremely large superflare on the red dwarf Aedileonis. Superflares result in massive magnetic storms with the potential of sterilizing habitable exoplanets. The astronomers were able to collect some very intriguing data. More information on these fundamental stellar phenomena will help us predict superflares and possibly mitigate magnetic storm damage here on Earth. That's what senior author Dr. Kazunari Shibata said, a scientist at Kyoto University. They might even be able to begin to understand how these emissions can affect the existence or emergence of life on other planets. Thanks for watching the first episode of this new Space News format. I hope you enjoyed it, and if so, like and share. Have you been able to watch NeoWires or did you watch the Spacewalk in HD already? Tell me in the comments. Have a wonderful week. And remember to check in next week for further exciting news.